Good morning, Brandy. How are you doing today? Good morning, Arrow. I'm great. How are you? Fantastic. Congratulations on this story. I, I, this is one of those books that's going to create conversation, and it starts with that with that book cover. And you know what I almost said? It starts with the album cover, because that's what it feels like. <laughs> it's like an album cover. It's colorful. It's bright. It says, hey, listen or read me. <laughs> I love that. Yes, I you know have nothing to do creative, creatively with the cover, but I absolutely loved it when they showed it to me. Putting this story together required what from your creative journey? Oh, gosh, so much. I feel like I really grew as a writer with this book. Um, You know, I think part of it was being able to write from three different perspectives. And then I think another part of it was being able to write these historical fiction sections uh, with Blossom Blackwood, the matriarch of the family. And so it was really cool and interesting to be able to do that research on the time period that I was writing about and then incorporate that into the story itself. Now, did you did you go through any moments of where you know a personality change? Because when you write about a family, you've got to be able to identify each member's own version of the story and personality. Right. Yeah, definitely. I feel like when, I think especially when I was writing Blossom's story, because, you know, it's so expansive. We see her move from a teenager in the 1940s, you know, up through the rest of her life without giving too much away about the book. And I would really feel sometimes like I was in her world. I would sort of have to step out of it and get back to, you know, 2021, 2022, all of that. And so that was really interesting. And then also being in the head of her great granddaughters, Hollis and Artis, who are the other two perspectives in the story. um, They're so different from each other and from her. So I really feel like I got to live out these different lives while I was writing the book. I wish I could have been there when you were doing the research for this, because, I mean, you really dug deep into this. And it's like, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that you'll carry with you forever. Absolutely. Yes. And, you know, I've always been interested in history and sort of the generations that came before me. Um, Some of that because when I was growing up, I would watch old Nick at Night episodes of shows that were on, you know, like way before my time. Uh, But they were really what I was interested in. And I just kind of wanted to know everything about that time period and how it was different from, you know, how I was growing up. So I got really immersed in it. And and you're not afraid to change your styles of writing because, I mean, from nonfiction, YA fiction, I mean, there's so many different sides to your creative personality. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you know, I think that's how we keep it interesting as yep. writers. Yep. Um, for me, I always want to challenge myself. Also, I feel like if I'm kind of doing the same thing every time, I don't feel like I'm growing as a writer. And that's really important to me to keep growing and improving my craft. I, I giggled like a child, though, when, when you describe Hollywood as it's everything personal and nothing private. Because, I mean, that's like, oh, my God, that is so true. <laughs> it really is. I think also today, you know, where there's so much social media, like none of this stuff existed when I was a kid. So you would just sort of see maybe a tabloid story about someone or if they did like an interview with Barbara Walters or something, you know, that was the only way you really got a peek into celebrity. And now it's just like celebrities are online and they're sharing a lot of their lives with us. But even if they're not really, you know, on social media or anything like that, people are still sort of digging into their lives. And so I just found it really fascinating to sort of examine, you know, like what is privacy to them? How much privacy do they get? How much more do they want? Like just so many different levels up to it. That's interesting that you bring that up because I know that in, in radio, they always tell us to, you know, billboard your thing. So people will stay with the radio station longer. They'll say, Hey, Justin Bieber, blah, blah, blah. I'll have the, that story in 10 minutes. As a listener, I'm going, no, I'm going to get that story right now. Cause I can go to social media. I'm not going to wait for you to tell me that story. Right. That's exactly. That's like the perfect example of how things have shifted. Whereas, You know, I think also our attention spans are just sort of disappearing or dissipating a little bit um, with the advent of social media. Speaking of that attention span, what is your magic or secret sauce to keep me on these pages? Because yeah, because you're right. We we, sometimes I'll say, all right, I'm only in the mood for two pages and I end up reading 10. And it's like, how, how did she do this to me? Right. Well, thank you. That's the biggest compliment ever for a writer. Um, You know, I always want to write the story that I would love to read. So I feel like, you know, some days, of course, with writing are easier than others, right? Like some days it just seems sort of flow out of you. Mm -hmm. You just have to make yourself stop. Other days it's like every word is just like a struggle to get on the page. But I always feel like, you know, if I go back and read over it, 
if I'm invested in it, if I'm interested in these characters and I sort of want to know where it's going next, then I feel like that's a really good sign for my readers. And so I just always try to make sure that I'm still interested in the story, that I'm still excited by what I'm putting down on the page. How do you keep your writing self conditioned? And the reason why I bring that up is because I I, I have to exercise that muscle. And I don't think a lot of listeners or readers understand Mm -hmm. that, that we've got to be practicing something. Like I'll do a thing called stream thinking. Give me 10 minutes, one page, writing about whatever is flowing through my moment of now. Oh, I love that. Yeah, for me, um, I do end up taking, you know, breaks. So I'm not a writer who writes every day. So right now I'm kind of taking a break, you know, with the book out. Um, and I have another book that I'll be getting edits back on soon. So I sort of weigh that, like, what do I have coming down the pipeline? And then I just sort of use um, the time between writing to fill up the well, you know, as they say. And so it's kind of sort of reading a lot of books, consuming a lot of, you know, television, movies, all of that. Um, and that always gets me excited to go back to writing. It's kind of strange as that sounds, like taking time away from it. But I really feel like for me and, you know, maybe other people, it's also, it's just really helpful to recharge. And then I'm even more excited to just come back to the page and get started again. How do you deal with the editing moments? Because that to me is something that raises my anxiety level because it's like, oh my God, now they've got my words. <laughs> what are they going to take out? What do I have to go rewrite? Blah, 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 blah. And you create it, you create this story inside your head and it's like, calm down, dude, you trust them. That's where, that's where it is. <laughs> Yes. No, you and me both, though, you know, because after a while, it's like, well, this is my story. But now someone else, like you said, is stepping in and they're giving their opinion. And sometimes they're right. And sometimes they don't quite get it right. But they're like hitting on something that you need to change. Um, I feel like it's a really delicate dance. But I think for me, the most important thing is always having an editor that I can trust. Um, And so my editor, Jordan Brown at Bowser and Bray, um, you know, an imprint of HarperCollins um, is truly amazing. And he just really digs into the story with you. And I just by the end of this process, you know, I think I might have even put it in my acknowledgments in the book that I felt like he cared about this family that I wrote about and that he knew them as well as I did. And so that's super important to me. And then that always makes me feel like I'm in safe hands. And I just feel like I can really just let go and write the story that needs to be written. I've always been that guy that loves, I mean, when, when something happens, I always believe that something had to happen beforehand. And people sometimes don't understand that side of my personality, but you do it so well. You celebrate the past to bring the future forward. And I love how you do that inside this book. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's so important. Um, you know, I grew up not really loving history, like history class mm-hmm. in school, because you know, no offense to my old teachers, but it just wasn't really taught in a very interesting way. But once I realized, you know, that I could sort of dig into history on my own and start researching stuff on my own and and read it and process it in ways that really worked for me, that were interesting for me, I thought, well, I can do that myself, you know, with my books. I can impart some of the things that really interest me, put them into my stories. And then, you know, maybe other people will learn something new, but they learn it in a format that doesn't feel like it's, you're being preached at. It's just a story, and then there happen to be some you know, actual historical facts in there, too. Well, you put something out there that, that a lot of listeners and readers don't know. They, you know. they always think that, oh, famous people are always happy. They're upbeat. They're, you know, okay, so they may trip and yeah. fall. They may not have a movie this time around. But you put something in there it, that, that there's, there is some mental abuse that takes place, but a lot of people don't know that because as an actor, we're very good at acting and hiding. Right, exactly. Right. I think that's so important. Like actors, you know, feel they have to put on this very public face. They can never show what they're struggling with. But, you know, I've lived in Los Angeles for 20 years and, you know, I don't really know. I don't roll in the (laughs) circles of famous people, but I certainly am surrounded by famous people and by, you know, the Hollywood machine, the industry. And I have friends who work behind the scenes. And so, you know, I am intellectually aware that these are real people, Mm -hmm. just like, you and me, but that can be so hard to process when you see them on your TV screen, on your film screen, and they're larger than life, and they're going to these premieres and wearing, you know, these fancy designer clothes and all this stuff. So for me, I really want to sort of dig into that and kind of examine some of my issues with um, separating that, you know, with actors separating the real person from the person that we see on screen. Yeah, I always call that the candy-coated plastic bathroom mirror smile, and it's like when you identify that with someone, you're going, ah, I know where you are right now. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Brandy, you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Oh, thank you so much. I really enjoy talking to you. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? Thank you.